So Mike just showed you the, uh, the quote from Tim O'Reilly about government as a platform. Like all of you, I'm inspired by Tim when he speaks. Um, a few months ago, I heard Tim give a talk in San Diego, and in that talk, he used a quote from uh, William Gibson, and you've probably heard it. It's, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. I believe that open data is the future. Open data is the future of how we govern. It's the future of how we deliver public services. It's the future of how we uh, engage and interact with the people that governments serve. And right now, that future is unevenly distributed. So I'm here to talk about open data standards and how we can use standards for open data to encourage local governments, small and medium-sized local governments, to adopt open data and to go open by default. So if we're going to do that, this is the equation we have to solve for. right? How do we get platforms that have tens and hundreds of millions of users to care about the data from small cities? So Evanston, Illinois, my company has the great pleasure to work with them, and we worked with them to release their restaurant inspection data and to transform it into an open data standard called LIBS, which was developed by Code for America in, in, uh, uh, in collaboration with Yelp. And very soon, you'll be able to see Evanston's restaurant inspection data in Yelp. Now, for this to work, for this to be repeatable, we have to understand the costs and the incentives on both sides of this equation. And I'm going to come back to that in just a little bit. Now, I want to be clear, there's a lot of great work happening with states and counties and cities all over the country, but I want to talk about cities. Cities are important. Cities provide core public services to us. State capitals can seem far away. We may only hear about them when a budget gets adopted or if you know, the legislators pull an all-nighter to get their work done at the end of a session, and you see those newscasts with you know, sleepy legislators, that kind of thing. But in cities, the people that represent us and serve us are our neighbors. They're the people behind us in line at the car wash. They're the parents that have kids in the same school as yours. Cities matter. Why small cities? So these are cities, small and medium-sized cities. First of all, there's a lot of them. There are a lot more than big cities. There are only so many Philadelphias and New Yorks and Chicagos. There are a lot more small and medium-sized cities. And these cities provide core services that we all rely on, right? Uh, they operate police forces and fire services. They collect our garbage. Uh, they are intimately involved in how our children are educated. They may operate transit systems and even airports. So small cities matter big. So let's take a look at the experience of big cities and small and medium-sized cities with open data. I don't think this will surprise many people, right? Big cities are doing a great job with adopting open data. And by almost any measure, the 34 cities that the US Census Bureau tracks that have a population above 500,000 are doing gangbusters on open data. That experience is very different with smaller cities. Of the 256 incorporated places that the US Census Bureau tracks, with populations between 500,000 and 100,000, just to look, let's look at that cohort, just to make it simple, we can see a much different experience with adopting open data. And by adopting it, I mean you've stood up an open data portal, or you've put open data on a website somewhere, or you've adopted a policy, or you've appointed an official, a very liberal uh, interpretation of what it means to adopt open data. Why is this happening? Well, we could, this is open for discussion. I don't have the answer here. We could chalk this up to the fact that big cities have more data. There are more people asking for data from these big cities, more researchers, more journalists, more civic hackers, more entrepreneurs, more startups. Uh, we could say that they have deeper pockets, they have more money to free up data. Uh, I don't know the answer here. This is definitely open for discussion. Why is this important? Well, because more people live in small and medium-sized cities than live in large cities. And I'll tell you something else. If one of the benefits of the way we do democracy in this country is that we have all of these governments all over the place, laboratories of democracy, as it were, then we're missing an opportunity if more cities don't adopt open data. We need more cities to adopt open data so that we can figure out what works and what doesn't work. So how do we fix this? I think Code for America is helping us fix this, really. If you saw the slide that Jen put up uh, earlier in the week, you saw small cities on that, uh, or I should say non-large cities on that, on that slide. Code for America has done work. You heard the story of Chattanooga here today. Uh, they've done great work in places like Macon, Georgia, South Bend, Indiana. So Code for America is definitely leading the charge here. Uh, I think we need better options for how small and medium-sized cities put data out for the world to use. If the budget footprint for an open data portal is the same as the salary for a teacher or a police officer or a firefighter or a building inspector, fundamentally, I have a problem with that. But I don't think that's sustainable. So we need more better open source options for data portals. I also, think, I also think standards are important. 
If it makes sense that governments come together to get better outcomes in purchasing, it makes sense that governments come together to get better outcomes in civic technology. And we do that through shared open data standards. So let's come back to this example I talked about before, Yelp and the city of Evanston. For this to work, for this to be repeatable, the benefits for governments and data producers have to be immediate and tangible. This cannot be an academic exercise in standardization. Government officials have to be able to open up Yelp and see their data there. And then you'll see the light bulbs go off. And for partners like Yelp and others, like Google and Zillow, and there's a bunch of them out there, and they're doing great work in this area. <clears throat> they do some initial work to figure out how they're going to bring this data into their platform. And then every successive city that they adopt, the cost has to go down. So the marginal cost of adding additional cities must trend towards zero. It has to go down. If it doesn't, then uh, uh, not surprisingly, we'll see these companies look to New York and Chicago and Dallas and LA. We'll see them go after the big cities. Now, for me, this has become a personal issue because I recently left a city that I love deeply uh, and, and un unashamedly uh, to move to a city that is much smaller. So I'm going to put my money where my mouth is here. And I really can't think of a better case study to do this with in Syracuse, New York. Uh, Syracuse is a city that has no open data right now but they have a police force, they have a fire service, they have one of the largest school districts in the state, they have a transit system, they have an airport, uh, they have a large university that you may have heard of, uh, which, by the way, also has the premier school for the study of public administration in this country. My apologies to anybody from the Kennedy School that's here. Uh, but no open data. They even have a, a, a civic hacking community that's getting started, but no open data. So we got all the ingredients here. Why no open data? Can we use open data standards to jumpstart open data in cities like Syracuse so that they can reap all the benefits that Ryan just talked about? I don't know the answer yet, but I can tell you that we're going to find out. Thank you.